Hi and welcome back. This is Disability Saves the World with Dr. Fadi Shinuda. I am Fadi Shinuda. I've been off for a couple of weeks trying to organize my life, but I'm very happy to be back. And so thank you for sticking around. So this podcast, if you're new to it, is uh, where I speak to leading experts in disability and math studies from around the world. You'll hear about the research and work of disabled scholars, activists, artists, and our allies. You'll also get some insight into their lives, their favorite non-DS activities, adventures, and hobbies. Most importantly, you'll hear how they think disability can save the world. My name again is Fadi Shinuda. I use he, him pronouns. I have a PhD. I identify as a fat, disabled cis man of color. If you don't know me, hopefully you'll get to know me a little bit more over the course of this pod. On today's show, I am joined by Jess Sash. Jess, who uses they, them pronouns, is an artist doing work in a combination of large-scale public sculpture wiring and poetry community space making. They have an upcoming book of writing and poetry tentatively called The Architectures of Liability published through the Musigetti's Foundation and P.S. Guelph. I'm excited to speak with them about their work. But I think it was Freedom Tube that really gave me the entry point into sculpture where I could talk about the body without representing my own body. Their life outside of artistry. Yes, I know you love stick, but before you bring home another <laughs> stick, you need to get rid of some of your sticks. <laughs> and to ask them how they think disability can save the world. Hi, Jess. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's uh, great to have a full-fledged artist um, (laughs) join me. I'm excited to talk to you about your work, uh, upcoming things you have planned, and maybe we'll jump right into segment one, a segment I like to call um, Inside the Project, the Work, uh, the Research, the Art. And I'd like to know how you got involved um, in things that related to disability and madness. Mm. Yeah, I was recounting this with a friend recently. Um, I guess that's a a fun uh, piece of information too, is I actually just started uh, uh, dating another disabled person during a time of quarantine who lives on an entirely different continent Uh, and and so in the get to know you process that's come up it's like our own history is connected to like movement work and uh both of us ended up uh sharing that we came to uh i guess disability and mad and deaf organizing uh actually through queer and trans activism and it's really interesting to talk to another person who's born with a genetic condition because like it's like thinking about a time before when I guess I'll I'll say it more so specific to Canada that it it wasn't as yeah I I feel like it wasn't as physical as they like uh like uh, connecting with other disabled communities beyond ways that were segregated institutionally uh so I think uh finding queer community was was connected to feeling like finding other other people like me and 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 uh in, in a way that felt celebratory whereas disability had still at that point remained something that i don't even know if i identified with right. or was even out of them uh and then and then finding the online keynote for the one-off conference that was the 2002 queer disability conference uh, i think eli claire had given that keynote I'm reading that and be like, what is this? Like the idea that those two, those two things together or the idea that one could identify with disability in a way that wasn't about a relationship with hospitals, you know, right. but that yeah. was, that somehow occupied a similar, what felt like anyway, a similar celebratory energy to queerness, uh, which, for which I'd, I'd only really ever had a relatively positive connection with, um, which I felt, I feel grateful for. Um, so yeah, I guess that's how, I it, it, and I guess that to answer your question was how I started creating art was um, I didn't even study art I was studying literature at the time uh, a degree that I never finished 
but the art the art making came out of read it being so like riveted by those thoughts that Eli and Claire had shared and, and others and others like him to the point of wanting to explore my identity through the visual representation uh, to feel connected to the things he was talking about. Um, yeah. And so you do um, use um, sculpture, kind of large scale public uh, sculpture. You also write poetry. You're also mm -hmm. doing other things like, you know, um, community space making. I'm wondering if you can tell us about your medium or your mediums. Uh, what are they? How did you experiment to, uh, you know, to, to, to end up using those particular ones uh, to make your art? Totally. Uh, I think we're, we're at a really interesting time. So I guess I've been engaging in the process of, of art making and space making as those two things are intertwined um, for, I don't, yeah, over 10 years now. Um, I started out engaging in self-representation through photography at a time before social media and selfies had the relationship that they do now. So it was still referred to as like self-portraiture. Uh, and it was very much connected to what I was reading at the time uh, from, from a place of queer and disabled community, which was still relatively um, unimaginable to me and not something I had access to like in my day to day, but definitely through online networks. Um, so starting out of photography, uh, connected me to those those communities and then very quickly felt uncomfortable because uh, for a long time it, it felt like that was all that was being like much like the fascination and complexity and, and exploitation of the you know the the arc of say Diane Arbus is the fasc fascination with the consumption right. of uh, another difference so I, as it was almost as, as soon as I stepped in to the world of photography by being in the contract photography festival that I just as quickly hated it because it was still so dominated by a gaze and also a lack of voice with people that take up space in those in the, in that medium which I don't know if it's how it's probably changed a lot but um it's very tech heavy and very like it's a lot about power and so I didn't like that the only way to feel like I can engage with art and conversation was having to sh show repeatedly show and repeatedly have demanded of me um, a photographic representation of my body and 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 somehow the idea that that there also somehow was a story or an autobiographic you know c consumption I guess like that kind of cataloging um, and it wasn't until I participated in uh, my first artist residency, which is the, the LGBT residency on the Toronto Island that's still going. Um, I was in the inaugural group, uh, but that was mm. the first time I had submitted a concept and, and thought about an idea of talking to disability as a possible community and culture in a medium that didn't involve needing to hand over a representation of myself. Um, and that was around the time that someone um, a friend had told me about the nickname in disability community for uh, Ben Noble plastic drinking straws, which have now become banned and contentious. But yeah. uh, she told me that the nickname there was a nickname Freedom to, and it was yeah. like it was like as soon as she said those two words, I had that like moment that we can often happen uh, that can often happen when you find. I sort of, it, yeah, like much like queerness, you find a, a celebration in, in, in this thing that you know intimately. And I just pictured a montage of any time I'd ever seen somebody use a straw in a way that would be deemed not conventional. And uh, so then that led to that first sculpture that I've since now done um, different iterations of at very massive scales for six years, uh, actually, uh, in uh, various places in the world um and using up to forty thousand drinking straws all threaded together not using any adhesive but just you know the the visible um rhythm and measurement of process and time which is so much a part of what 
you know, disabled community and living and community space like eight years ago is that the art itself is the art of being alive and of doing and of like nourishment. So um, I've since then gotten the opportunity to work with, I do a lot of metal work uh, and welding, but I think it was Freedom Tube that really gave me the entry point into sculpture where I could talk about the body without representing my own body, if that makes sense. Does absolutely, and I and I think a lot of people will uh, agree that uh, you know moving away from or reframing straws as freedom tubes really mm -hmm. is like a significant like um, you know world changing of world views, right? And so mm -hmm. therefore, you can uh, enter the world of disability and disabled people's experiences through those two words, and then again like through the art that they you then depict through those two words. Um, um, to kind of open people's perspective on like the significance of these tiny pieces of plastic for a whole community. Um, absolutely, absolutely, and I feel like that's probably something that's resonating for a lot of folks now because, as much as that's where perhaps the inspiration and the excitement of, you know, the jest of twenty thirteen came from, it's never been a sculpture that says you have to approach it with. An, an experience of an insight of disability or disabled living you can like everyone seems to approach that sculpture and and love it and get it and find joy in it especially children <laughs> like and so that's the beautiful and i think um thing that's translated right i think right now with a lot of what we're experiencing through quarantine. I, I, I feel like I've been already witnessing that in the experience of uh, installing Freedom Tube with audiences. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen the sculpture myself, but mm -hmm. I can imagine somehow that it's both like weighty, but also mm -hmm. because it's made of like, like pl very light plastic that mm -hmm. it also qu kind of shifts and could change and Absolutely. Uh, might because you said there's no adhesive might also move and that's interesting to me to think of like uh in relation to disability as well, right? As as a thing that it is certainly not linear and certainly not um, you know, static in any particular way. Absolutely. And one of the most interesting things in that six year relationship that I have had to the sculpture is uh how much of it, you know, is uh a negotiation with curators, right? Because mm -hmm. you're dealing with 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 you're dealing with an art object that is not precious by any means, and that it, and that is hung at a height that can be touched. And in fact, I've started like the last few times I've included vinyl that literally just says "touch me, move me," uh, like installed on the wall in really large font or on the floor, uh, and kids can and have and do approach it and will walk through it. It's it's in the shape of like a like a waterfall or a like set of curtains. And you can hide inside it. You can rip them off. Wow. And which which often sends the art institution into a panic, right? The idea <laughs> that something can be but the thing is you can reattach it. That very same kid or person who like pulls a bunch off can be a part of remaking the thing. Like there is it's like kind of reminds me like of what got me excited back when back in my baby theory days about to lose an Atari and ideas of, of assemblages and that you know just because you lose a limb you don't become like less like minus of a person and just yeah. because you gain a prosthetic doesn't mean you become a multiplicity both are always true at the same time right and as a sculptural experience it, it does really embody that and it's never felt like my own for that reason it's always felt like a representation of like a lot of things at once but the most fun thing of it is a lot yeah the last time i installed it in uh mississauga at the small arms building was uh getting to do uh a studio tour with um a specifically a uh, disabled identified 11th and 12th grade class and watching a bunch of like self-identified uh neuro atypical folks and neurodivergent folks engage in in freedom too in a way that like was deeply understood without any explanation at all. You know, all we called that that talk was just what is sculpture, which is silly, but also like very to the point, right? The idea of like who gets to access what objects and what objects are deemed art or conceptual or a conversation. Uh, and it's also just a really fun sculpture to, to like 
one person ran through it and it just went flying and then there's like all these straws on the ground but then you know afterwards I like I like work on it like a gardener you know I just like add things I'll add things back until it looks flush again but yeah I'm I'm like smiling like ear to ear because like, <laughs> oh, yeah. like these stories are so they're so full of joy so right full of joy. oh that's what I was going to tell you uh since you I think you hadn't seen it so I use specifically the um the very iconographic Norman Rockwell uh specifically the red and white plastic bendy okay uh, yeah. be- because like you said in an individual straw it's very weightless uh, and the bendable aspect allows for a kind of flexibility. And it's just like such a recognizable object. And then I create every strand is 10 straws long, but they definitely, they come, they come out in different lengths, but that's just the rhythm that I keep. Um, but then on mass, it doesn't look red and white at all. You wouldn't even be able to tell what it was. It looks bright, like a light pale pink. Mm. And it kind of looks like jellyfish tendrils. Like it becomes so amazingly like, I don't know, biotic and like, yeah, it 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 even has a joyful color to it. Like it, yeah. <laughs> and and where is it currently? Uh, it is currently uh not assembled anywhere and wrapped up, um, because in the arc of its life, um, last year was when the straw band controversy arose, which was interesting because. That was a conversation, and I'm sure I don't even have to get like I don't even have to unpack this with you. It's just like how the straw, because of one video with a turtle, became this like this this way that we could talk about the imprint of human violence while creating an entire decoy out of it. Yeah. Like, let's use the straw as a way to not deal with it, and even worse. Um, like, oh, I know what we got to do. And instead of sitting with the fact that we, there's this, this imperialism that's going to take so long to like, heal and undo, it was just like as, you know, this like rush ahead to try to create a replacement uh, with paper straws or metal straws while ignoring the fact that, like, well, okay, metal is a product of the mining industry. I don't think a single person tested the paper straws because I've used them and they unravel every time you Thank use you. them. And it just, it's funny, but it's also not because instead of sitting with the, the, the complexity of the situation, it was just this. Like, I, the last couple times I showed the work, I often had, like, it never failed some middle class, like, lady, like, charge at me being like, have you ever thought of using metal straws? <laughs> like, just, like, like, just, I don't know, the way we need to sort of, like, point at the violence of other people in this strident way uh, and not think about violence as a, as a, yeah, a part of being alive in a way that, like, like creates a space for accountability and, and, and grief and pain in a, in a whole, you know, in more holistic senses of it. It's, like, it became a conversation that some folks just would get mad at just even the sight of these classic straws as art. Assume that I was creating waste. It's like, even go as far as to react as though I was the reason for all the straws in the sea. <laughs> and like, <laughs> um, you know, like, like, I kid you not, like the way some people get amped up, straws are bad, plastic straws are bad. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, let's talk about this. But at the same time, people not wanting to like even acknowledge that I was the artist or, or talk to me or, or, or think like you know, it, I was never upset that these were feelings that they were having, but there was definitely not an interest in like unpacking like all the yeah. <laughs> all that emotion, and it's it's part of the problem, right? So yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, I I when I'm you know, there's lots of conversations about like paper straws, metal straws, the fact that paper straws unfold and don't work. Metal straws can yeah. be really harmful for people who the differently. Exactly. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, for me, it's like the conversations uh, that focus on, you know, environmentalism and straws. I'm always like, what are your stance on the U.S. military as like the largest producer of like yep. missions in the world, right? And, and like, and, was- and interesting, and interestingly, <laughs> we could be talking about this right now. Like, okay, well, plastic straws. One site that they exist in a lot is, you know, medical medical complex like medical mm. complexes and institutions right. uh what do these same people have to say about all the ppe 
like right. that that's everywhere uh, like all over the street now and like and it's so necessary to what like to systems that currently exist in order to provide medical care in a pandemic even I was just listening to the news this morning and there's been more fires than ever since January because people are home and, you know, people are cooking and all these kinds of things. But one of the issues too is that people are wanting to reuse their plastic materials. And so people mm-hmm. think that one way of sanitizing them is to put them in their microwave. Oh, good grief. Off the bacteria. But of course that causes like home fires. So yeah. people, like the like the recycling rhetoric it's yeah. causing harm, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's like, no, right now we need to toss these things out. There are other, yep. other things that may, that we, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I hence, hence, hence very quickly understanding that what was underneath um, that, that aspect of freedom too, that admittedly I considered in the onset, but haven't fully unpacked to that degree because 2013 was a different time. Like it, it doesn't feel like that long ago, and yet it was also a lot long ago in a, in a, a certain kind of consciousness. Um, but like needing to unpack, okay, what are people upset about, and like what does it mean to have it directed at, at me, the artist? What does it mean? for how they're thinking about their own relationship to these things how do they think these things will be solved and and what's interesting is every time the conclusion for me is an emotional relationship and how the biggest violence is is um, these neglected muscles of being able to account for our own context you know politically economically uh and and work collectively to be uh very transparent about all these things and where we all kind of fit in that shared responsibility and how that's really the labor but that seems absolutely. to make us the most uncomfortable of all right uh, yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> you did mention Deleuze and so uh, you know I, I don't want to I don't want to pass that away without comment um, okay. because I think I think I want to know is there an underlying theory or a set of principles or guidelines that um, you approach your work um, is it academic or is it community-based or or how is it that you know um, you ensure that your work does align with kind of the principles that you're trying to put forward? Um, I think it was important to mention the lose because a younger version of myself, you know, it's like that. Speaking to what we're talking about, it's like we are we are all just a map of many things, right? And so it was perhaps Eli Claire's keynote that led me to the idea of queerness and disability together it was to lose and Atari that like and and my trying my best to understood those theorists and uh, the ideas of assemblages uh, that led me to the idea of the possibility of, of creating through sculpture in a way that had nothing to do with the body and and so thus sort of perhaps creating an apparatus through which I could I could protect the disabled body um, in art from needing to be consumed. Um, I don't think I necessarily create any lore in a way that always centers or necessitates theory. Um, I guess lately, but, but it's also important to cite and credit those things. Um, I think, I think currently, like, uh, Audrey Lord has been coming out for a lot of people um, in a lot of articulations that have never ceased to be relevant, I think perhaps because of the arc of late capitalism and, and where feminism was in the, you know, in the 80s, uh, which I've been thinking about recently since catching that panel with uh, Naomi Klein and uh, Angela Davis on Zoom and thinking of their contextualizations. And uh, it was a great conversation. Um, but I've been saying this phrase ever since like quarantine here in a Canadian context and watching, I guess, observing how people are behaving in the art world, which is mostly where I feel like my thinking and my work gets housed and and specific to a Toronto context, I'll say. Um, And like watching people respond uh, artistically to the fall of capitalism with capitalism. And I realized yesterday, I was like, oh, that's just like Audrey Lorde one-on-one, you know, that's like, <laughs> like thinking, 
that's thinking through, like, you know, you can't bend the container, you can't, you know, master's tools cannot be used to dismantle the master's house, and, like, and then, like, but seeing it in practice from people that, you know, do, do want to create, you know, thoughts around, like, revolutionary, like, um, you know, an, an evolved set of systems, but have, have, you know, you know, in an embodied sense, committed themselves so much to a response to that I don't even can, can see that that's what they're doing. You know, like I, I, the only, it's like, it feels like there's two conversations happening right now. And I don't, I don't know if, if you can relate to like, this is, seems to be a part of the theme of your, your podcast. Um, but like, there's the conversations I'm having with disabled people right now, and then there's the conversations that, like, a lot of other folks are having. And I don't mean to say it's all like, disabled people and bad people and deaf folks, uh, but folks that perhaps think, think in that paradigm, I suppose, where I joked uh, on a board meeting recently, I'm on the editorial advisory for C Magazine. People were like, oh, how's everyone doing, da, da, da. And I sort of joked when it got to be my turn that the only thing that's really shifted about my reality in terms of day-to-day is that, like, all of a sudden, overnight, the guilt of capitalism was removed. And the idea that my pace is now kind of what everyone's pace is, you know, like, this sort of slowing down. And so I don't know if that answers your question about informed theory. I definitely think through community work, I've tried, I've, I've noticed the ways that I've grown to be informed just as much, if not maybe more so from a place of practice, more so than theory. But I also, I also love theory and, I, and, and poetry, which I often like to, like in, in the age of like Instagram and um, independent media, um, I think poetry can also be treated as, as theoretical text too sometimes, so. Well, I like that. I mean, what's nice is that you seem to have, you know, your hands and feet and other limbs and in all (laughs) kinds of places. And I think that is uh, partly like why we look to artists. I think academics particularly, why we look to artists because, um, you know, often we are not in those spaces. I think that's clearly shifting and changing, thankfully. Um, um, Because we yeah we need to we need to venture into other places having different conversations looking at different media um and different representations in order to make you know our work more relevant but also to to make it um impactful to community because what is the point if the community you know is telling us that you know you don't speak to us you don't reflect you're not improving our lives in any particular way Big time, and I don't think it always has to feel. And I, I'm glad I'm welcoming this shift because I don't think it always has to feel so. And I don't think it always did. If memory serves, <laughs> I've been out of the academy for a while, but um, so quite so polar, right? Like, uh, oh yeah, well, philosophy and poetry and English literature, uh, that was perhaps more dense, uh, and was within reach for me at the time, did inform how I thought and made art. And now that I, it's not maybe as as immediate to me, it it maybe doesn't and it doesn't mean one is better or worse or, or what have you is just uh, I think that's like access 101 right I think it's a, I think critical thought and theory and philosophy are amazing but for some folks those are languages that perhaps are just indiscernible and that's also okay like it's yeah I don't think that inherently a community space and speaking plainly I don't think that that's what accessibility means the idea of like you know, like, I think it's, like you said, I think that's the, the dance that art fills, right, is, is finding creative ways and whatever language to say thoughtful things uh, and to include the most perspectives possible, I suppose. Absolutely. I, I do want to move on to segment two, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Um, I call this the middle or the liminal space. And I wondered if you could speak to Uh us about someone who you are crushing on, who you cannot stop either reading or watching or even just recommending to other people to consume. Oh, oh goodness. I like thought about this and I even wrote notes. And then now that you you asked, (laughs) Um, I, yeah, I, I love you. One of the things I love about being an artist, which isn't always, like, I love just 
going to things a lot and attending as, as many like art openings or talks or just like so I will say I, I crush on a lot of artists a lot like I uh one of the one of my favorite experiences of last year uh IRL was uh, an artist that was in a group show called Resonant Bodies um at uh oh what's the acronym Toronto Media Arts Center so TMAC uh, and it was in the middle of the summer, uh, and it, the show was only up for a week, but uh, it's cl- it was within walking distance of my house, and so I just went every day, because I was so in love with this one uh, artist in this group show. Uh, that what was unique about it is that uh, it it was all artists that were invited to create installation, installation work, so physical work, uh, that, that involved sound. So it was all sound art. Uh, and my favorite piece was by Phoebe Wang, and she basically had created an entire, like, in the corner of this big, white, empty room, she, like, created, like, a false wall, and, like, and then, like, had a door into this, like, secret, tri- I called it the secret triangle room, and she, like, she, uh, she either repainted the walls, and, like, made it all, like, this kind of puce color, and, uh, carpeted it with a match uh, with carpet to match the same color uh, and had this 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 audio uh, on a loop and uh, I was spending time in it every day it had a very cathedral cathedral quality and uh, at one point a friend and I like had a hangout in there and like ate peaches and like took a nap like it was this sort of <laughs> this amazing and if you know all this <laughs> um, but like yeah I had a, a crush on her her offering it was such a uh, like a labor of love to create a whole other world inside a gallery right where it was just a small piece right but then it was like a place to rest and and with it like the the area that 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 art space is is right by Lisgar Park so it's a very it's sur- it's like condos on all sides and it's like a very there isn't a lot of places that feel inviting of rest um uh, and and I think people in the art world when they found that I was living inside the show found it amusing because the idea that you would go to something like more than just for the opener where people just sort of network with each other and it's a little too overstimulated to even necessarily get a good experience of the art but that someone would go would go every day people found odd and funny and 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 I can't even tell you I thought about it that much other than to be excited that I could access it for a week and just be there and be calm and what have you um so I would say I get crushes on artists a lot and that's one of the things I love about being an artist is constantly getting to experience how other people experience the world around them um but in terms of theory stuff or philosophers uh there is a a youtube clip i always appreciate the era of the internet where you you're able to access like snippets and pieces of and i'm sure you can relate to this one um conferences that you were never at like getting to access like nuggets of those conversations absolutely Uh, graduate seminars yeah totally yeah no exactly and i i I, yeah i love that everything like that's yeah um i don't I don't really often feel FOMO. There's just, I just love that much like you could never read all the books that exist, like that there's now this internet set of portals, you know. <laughs> uh, but there's this, this amazing, and I don't even think it was a keynote, but uh, a speaker at a, and I, I'm going to forget the, na- the name of the conference, but it had to do with, it was an American conference and it had to do with uh, uh, drug policy in, in, a US, in a U.S. context. And the speaker's name was Deborah Peterson Small. And I believe the name of her her speech, which was a very succinct 10 minutes. Like she just had this like, this like, that is short, the brevity of that. And to say what she managed to say and all that was like, um, the theme that you can find it on YouTube. Uh, and I believe it was maybe five years ago, but she was, saying and tethering it to the history in the US, which Canada is connected to obviously. Um, we are addicted to denial, punishment, and the American dream. And the way it connects so much of yeah, like history, um, the the carceral imp- implications on bodies that we're seeing now with respect to prisons, institutions, palliative care facilities. Uh, any kind of 
inhibition, like a control over the movement of certain bodies. She just connects to those themes um, and and their histories, and just I don't know. I can't stop recommending that talk to people because I it is so incredibly accessible, and it also deals with the topic of addiction in a way that, quite frankly, is to me so honest and relevant to people to all of us in ways that you don't necessarily have to identify at, as an addict yourself to to in engaging with what she's saying, see the connection that you yourself have to addiction, um, if that makes sense at all, and like, and how it's so economically um, keyed up, I suppose, to keep to keep everybody contributing to to a larger system that that creates addiction in the first place. Uh, uh, also, po also that, yeah. poetry. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I'll definitely link that to uh, the a link to her talk in the description so that. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. It's super short. Um, and it's just, it's only really contextualized with thinking theory of yeah, prisons and drug policy in the U.S., but it 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 landed with me. I, I feel like it applies to so much um, that a lot of us are thinking through. And even, even though I do believe it was like five years ago, it's still very relevant. Oh, um, yeah. Sure. Um, um, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Did you want to also? Oh, I was going to say, and always poets. I, I do <laughs> appreciate, um, I do appreciate the age of social media and platforms. Like, of course, there's the problem of like the corporatization of social media platforms, but I don't think that makes the concept of social media inherently bad because humans are meant to be social. Um, so I will say like, I do like mediums like Facebook and Instagram that do allow for a lot of multimodality. Like you can you can post a, a set of words or an image or both or what have you. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're not there's not a complexity and a flaw in that. But that said, it's those are mediums through which I I have read so many yeah wonderful poetic thoughts and um, yeah I don't know I just. I'm excited by how many people are just engaging in poetry and not even identified as poets, like people that are, are just sharing so collectively and hyper, you know, like there's just this like onslaught of a, like a hyper, hyper, hyper democratic, uh, creative cultural swell, you know? Yeah. I think there's like, like there's a real deep analysis that's happening on Twitter every single day from people who would never consider themselves like academics or, any yeah. kind of like doing any analytical work and often would refer to what they're doing as kind of shade or, or yes. as, um, you know, criticism or as these things. But I'm like, this is a deep analysis that you've just offered that is somehow both incredibly smart and incredibly funny. Right. And, oh, totally, totally. and I just, yeah. And I, I do think I agree with you, like as problematic as these platforms are, they're also like really important uh, because mm -hmm. of their democratizing abilities. I'm wondering if we can, um, in speaking about like, you know, social media and, and, and different platforms that are often used by young people and often, you know, framed for young people. I wonder if you do have advice for young artists and specifically for young disabled artists. I think now is a really exciting time to be doing that because we're seeing sort of a deterioration of like, institutional thinking and so I on the one hand I, I would imagine and you don't have to be young to be emerging as an artist I think anyone considering engaging in art right now you know uh, is is emerging in that in that forging of a relationship um, I would say my advice would be to like let go of the idea that you and again this is where the whole referential thing like um yeah, like it's been said before, but let go of the idea that because of like the sculpting of marginalization and, and, and more attention paid to certain voices um, historically over time, like let go of the idea that you have to spend years creating a platform first before you can say what you want to say. Uh, I think we're seeing so many like, um, like relationships forming uh, through social media 
as as an example of a place where communities are finding each other and creating a language, you know, that doesn't that is slowly like not requiring, even though people will always probably demand, you know, eligibility from you. It's not something you owe anyone and we're seeing that there's ways, you know, in lieu of our current political, you know, context and and, and shifts that that you can so you can still be successful, though not a requirement to be successful, and, and speak in languages you want to speak in without having to always explain. Uh, and that people will, it has been my experience, of, that people will find you and people will just understand what you're, what you're offering. And I guess um, as much as we, there is the fight to survive and things are being reassessed you know, with the idea of possibly UBI uh, and what have you, like, there doesn't have to be, I'm excited and I'm, and I'm you know, that, that, that there is a discussion now, but that there doesn't have to be this commitment to, you know, uh, exchanging all that you are and about how your identity shapes, how you see, see the world in order to be able to make, you know, to, to be able to survive uh, in, in producing art. Uh, and uh, I can't, I imagine it would be different to experience this as a younger person right now because your consciousness is still forming. And I'm sure you, you've observed that as well. Like I have friends that are younger and I, I do see um, the, the manifestation of their younger person insecurities based on, yeah, you're still growing, you're still thinking through what it means to be a person, to be alive. Um, but what's cool is that there's a lot of different and shifting mediums out there and like like I think it's mediums like TikTok, for example, are amazing because they're so limited by a certain frame of time and also <laughs> they're not really legible to like the older guard and, and there's a lot of freedom in that. Like you can create some really profound stuff. Like you said about Twitter, right? Like yeah. with those those platforms with those limitations, but they are a place of such popular engagement, you can actually create some of your best stuff in that way and absolutely. then yeah absolutely. yeah so i'd say my, my advice is my advice would be like work just work on finding your voice and uh yeah great um so let's move on to segment three um i call this outside the project the research the work the art i'm wondering if you could tell us about um your f a famous person encounter um and what was that like <laughs> like what kind of famous <laughs> well i guess yeah i mean it it depends uh have you met famous people and and i i have i guess i can tell you my earliest famous person encounter sure yeah. um, so i grew up in a small town about an hour north of toronto and <laughs> It's often the site uh, that companies will use to shoot movies. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, and I, I don't actually know why that is. Maybe because like, it's cheaper and it's rural and it's Canada. I don't know. So there was a movie set to be shot at my elementary school when I was about 13. And I think because, uh, I guess because I'm like kind of petite, I was selected to be an extra. So, like, they often try to get, like, older kids that are somehow still small because they take direction well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, this movie, back in the day, that this was a thing, went straight to VHS, DVD, whatever. Uh, so, it was never in theaters, but uh, it was a film starring Sigourney Weaver. Whoa! And Julianne Moore. Whoa! And <laughs> called A Map of the World. Uh, kind of a dark, kind of a dark film, but um, uh, there was this one scene where we were in a hallway of the school, and we had to do so many takes of this one scene where we were instructed that as soon as the bell rang, we were to run out of the classrooms, down the hall, like it was like like schools out for the summer, and <laughs> I was one of those cheeky kids, but like me and my best friend were both cast as extras, so I was like. I was like, Fiona, okay, we're, like, we were told explicitly don't look at the camera, but I was like, instead of looking at the camera, when we leave the classroom, like, why don't you, like, just turn around and look at me and we'll high five, and just, like, <laughs> such a cheeky way to try to make sure we could spot each other on this film when it came out, <laughs> but unfortunately, during one of the takes, somebody, 
a lot bigger than me, like pushed me or like ran into me. And I lost my balance and I I fell. She was standing right beside the classroom I was in. I fell face first into Sigourney Weaver's butt. Oh no. <laughs> and then she turned around really in the way that felt so slow. Like when you're 13, she turned around slowly and looked down at me and I just looked up at her and like I just ran away. <laughs> oh my god! So that was how I met Gordy Weaver. Uh, yep. <laughs> but first, that's how you met. But yeah, right in the butt, which is probably how tall I was at her height. <laughs> right. tall. I mean, she's really tall, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was horrified. Oh my god! And I love I like. It's kind of like that. It's the reaction is very much like a young person, like oh, just run sure. away. <laughs> just run! The fuck that. I know what to do. Run. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, Chloe, Chloe. That other person was in it too. Chloe Seven Um, I still remember at the end of that day where we all got paid. I like. I still remember getting handed my forty-two dollars because <laughs> legally you had to pay like seven dollars an hour or something like. That. <laughs> oh, oh my god. So yeah, that's that's my famous that's person. That's your famous person story. That's pretty yeah. good. So um do you carry an obscure fact, uh a kind of tidbit or a kind of piece of knowledge that you uh pull out when there's like a lull in a conversation? Oh, this is such a good question because because probably like I feel like I get in trouble for this a lot, even if it's just <laughs> like like, like, even if it's pieces of information about my own past, that my friends will be like, what? You never told me, like, like, um, there's a few people that just know me specifically with, like, visual art, but then, like, they find out that I'm a classically trained tap dancer, and it elicits that reaction of, like, what? You're, like, it's, like, the reaction <laughs> of, like, being a secret tap, not just a tap dancer, but a secret tap dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if, yeah, I feel like I, I definitely know random facts as well. Oh, it's like none of those things come to your mind where you're asked that question, but then of course, yeah. they just they just constantly fly out of like, no, no, nothing's coming to me. I, yeah, no, but, think, but yeah, I definitely secret facts answer. about myself. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's an obscure fact. I think that that qualifies, <laughs> absolutely. Um, my next question is, uh, what are you reading now? What is on your bedside table or the thing that you're kind of carrying around with you, um, uh, that you, that you're reading? Uh, I'm actually, I'm reading a few things. I, um, I think it's like, yeah, the, the reading question, I don't know if you can relate to this, but like. I'm often reading a couple things at once, like maybe one one piece of nonfiction, one book of poetry. Um, uh, like yeah, I like I like going back and forth in that way. Um, so the book of poetry, I'm currently sitting in my bed office, and so the book of poetry right beside me, I'm I'm slowly going through. Um, is is by a poet, Tackerlick Partridge. It's called curved against the hull of a peterhead. It's a really wonderful uh, collection of poems, and it's published through a friend of mine, actually. Ella uh, uh, Jimmy was the curator that oversaw its public, uh, publication. Uh, it's a partnership uh, with the, the publication, the small press, P.S. Guelph. So you can, yeah, you can find it on their website. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us um, if you have a hobby and how you got started in that hobby. And if you don't like the term hobby, it's um, is there something that you do that um, gives you joy? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know that I necessarily experience a differentiation between hobbies and work I, I think at this point it, everything kind of just feels like the act of doing um and I really love acts of doing that involve joy I guess 
I currently, but I'm not, I know I'm not alone in this, currently beside my bed, I'm trying to nurture some tomato seedlings. And so maybe that qualifies as a hobby because I haven't figured it out yet. It just to me, it just feels like a new relationship. Right, yeah. Um, With your food, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I would say opportunities to kind of engage with dance again like I I am yeah I am classically trained from childhood but you know that was early mid 90s at a time where there was still so much equalism kind of wrapped up in in dance that it kind of perhaps was considered a hobby in my body you know like the idea of being legible as as good at something or professional at something wasn't there so that's probably why like it felt like up until more recently, since I've been adding dance into my performance like, practice, uh, it did feel like I've been a secret tap dance. <laughs> uh, so maybe dance, I would say, felt like a hobby for a long time, but actually, I don't know that that threshold <laughs> is necessary. Um, I also really enjoy collecting random objects off the street. Um, a lot of what I do with sculpture has been about a collection of things that are otherwise free or discarded, and that would include straws, because, like, those are, up until recently, plastic straws also signify, like, food courts and places where things like that are, are free objects. Uh, so the, the most exciting free object I found on the street, uh, I found two days ago, uh, Perfectly in my size, I found a pair of one of those like old, like wood, like handcrafted wood pair of crutches. Oh wow! They, yeah, they're beautiful, and I I live in Parkdale, so often things like that, like treasures like that, are just on the street. Like there's just often I'm used to in my community, there's just be a lot of cacophony around, and a lot of just like objects, just random objects are just always around. And so I, I love finding them and like being a bit of a like squirrel and a magpie and like bringing things like that home and then getting to sit with them and decide what I'll end up doing with it, you know? Uh, so I might end up like putting taps on the bottom of those crutches and, and you know, choreographing with them. I might just hang them on my wall. But yeah, they're, they're real, they're, they're beautiful. I don't think I'd ever seen wooden crutches myself like up like firsthand because everything's kind of, stainless steel metal now it's like surgical kind of grade yeah i mean i've never seen those before but you know i i think parkdale is a place where you could find a lot of like lost or free objects as you said you know i follow someone uh on instagram called parkdale life i don't know if yeah. you follow them and parkdale life is always oh, they follow me back oh <laughs> nice yeah, nice. yeah no Parkdale Life is, is a main account, and uh, I remember when that account was still just starting, and they, yeah, they, like, followed a bunch of, like, like, people in Parkdale are, are kind of, been, are kind of like that, too, right? There's a lot of folks, we're all character, characters to each other, like, folks hang out on the street a lot and walk around a lot, myself yeah. included, and so objects and people kind of go hand in hand, a lot of things have character, and, and just look and feel so exciting when you find them, and, uh, yeah, as a as a sculptor, I'm like wow, like just endlessly fascinated. Like, yeah, and you're giving things like a new home and a new opportunity, and like, yeah, I think I mean I think that's great that you picked them up. I I mean I've been taking pictures of lost things that I found when I was in London, <laughs> um, as like a way of you know I once I think the most memorable thing I found was like a small bow tie that happened to be made completely out of sequins. Wow. And I was like, and I just took a picture of it and I was like, who, what child or what person <laughs> lost this like bow tie? And it was very beautiful, but I just left it where it was. It was like on top of like an electrical box too. So I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like a um, weird place for it. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, yeah, you can't, you can't take everything home. Which, and I, I've had roommates before tell me, like, Jess, I know you love sticks. <laughs> I, know you, I know you love sticks. But before you bring home another <laughs> stick, you need to get rid of some of your sticks. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's fair. Oh, <laughs> um, but yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I I want to end, of course, by asking you the question I ask everyone at the end is, um, how do you think disability can save the world? I think, 
I think we've had a really great chat and I think a lot of the answer is already there. Like the idea that like I feel like disability can save the world by like by being. I know that sounds like like really off switching in, but it's like I found that with some of my favorite moments in art, just the ability to kind of be still is something that disability has as its quality. Um and I was actually having a great conversation this morning with my brother who actually uh, studies culture. But um, we were talking about how, like, he's, he's been going on and on with me around, like, stuff about UBI as a conversation and, and the move towards an end of labor and, and automation and things like that. And I was thinking about how, you know, I don't think, I know disabled folks and community are having a hard time right now. I, I'll speak for myself, processing grief around, like, we've lost a number of of really, you know, important folks in the last month alone, there's been a lot of deaths connected, mm-hmm. you know, connecting a lot of us. Um, um, but I, I think in that grief, especially in the like, you know, feelings of being left behind from conversations that perhaps, you know, disability community has, has been a part of starting, um, I don't think it comes at, like, at a feeling of any kind of fear of like robots or like, like, like my brother was talking about like yeah robotic you know ai and robotic labor and virtual realities but I'm like you know i find those those i think a lot of disabled people relate to those possibilities with excitement because the idea of like like ending labor and, and causing things and, and slowing down is is where a lot of folks live and i think some of the grief that hasn't been specific to human lives lost for me right now is in the initial wave of this, you know, feeling like overnight, everyone, it also like overnight, uh, there was all of a sudden this universal legibility and feeling like every, all of a sudden everyone was disabled. And, and how a lot of us have been longing for that for a long time. Uh, and I expected it to feel euphoric and instead it felt sad, like, because it came from the place of like, oh, wait, this was just possible? this whole time to make everything accessible and slow down and, and what have you. Um, and so having to kind of move through that. Uh, but I think at the core of those feelings and, and that grief is feeling like your question is a really important one. I think that is the way disability can save the world is, is if we can collectively get to that place of beingness, you know, uh, and being together and being with. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a word in German that like roughly translates colloquially in English to like in solidarity um but it's like there's the really common you know Heidegger like docile uh but then the word for in solidarity like to be to be with is mit sein and I really like I liked learning that that word had the very same cadence as like the Heidegger the Heidegger docile um anyway so yeah I think that's my my answer. I didn't expect to bring up Heidegger. <laughs> I know. I love that. I mean, I think, uh, I think, I agree with you that uh, there's a there is something there is a grief to knowing that it could always be this way and could have mm-hmm. always been this way. Um, that does bring us some joy, but also with it, a uh, grief of you know, all those people who couldn't keep up, right, or yes. can't keep yes. up, who. Um, not not just we lost, but we're also have always been pushed to the fringes, right? And absolutely. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think disability can provide us with a new lens. But yeah, that uh, I think being able to realize that that feeling for me is that institutional neglect, uh, and realizing that like that's kind of at the core of the piece of writing I mentioned that I'm that I'm working on. That's going to be poetic. Uh, that I originally was joking, like have told folks that I've been calling the architectures of liability, which is tethered very much to that notion of institutional neglect, and I'm considering renaming it um, kind of in honor of the thoughts of like being in time and just reversing the words to to be the two words time being, and and mm-hmm. kind of as an, an homage to like what we're talking about and disabled folks and the idea that, you know, the present is the future kind of thing, and like, yeah, so... I think that's I think that's great. Time being. Yeah. That's wonderful. 
Jess, thank you again for talking to me. I really appreciate it today. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks again to Jess for coming on the show. Get in touch by sending me an email at disabilitysavestheworld at gmail.com. If you're interested in learning more about me, check out my website, fadeeshenuda.com. This podcast is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Fadi Shenuda. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time on Disability Saves the World.